In a world where the line between reality and fiction is constantly being questioned, there are those who dare to enter the dark chasms of our existence. From unexplained phenomena to the downright terrifying world of true crime, stories portraying the dark side of humanity have been passed down from generation to generation. Join us as we venture out into the abyss, delving into some of the most spine-tingling encounters to ever have occurred. This series is not for the faint of heart. Many of the details surrounding these stories are going to be graphic and may be disturbing to some viewers. With that, let's get into Three Creepy Things Episode 2. In this episode, we'll be getting into a variety of categories involving one true crime story, a missing persons case, as well as one of the largest massacres on humans by animals in history. So this first one takes us to the town of Villisca back in June of 1912. You see, there was this rather affluent Presbyterian family known as the Moors. Well, this family of six consisted of parents Josiah and Sarah along with their four children, Herman, Mary, Arthur, and Paul. Now it is said the Moors were sort of an upstanding family within the community. This isn't to say no one had a grudge against them, but for the most part, not a lot of people had a beef with them. As a matter of fact, many of the citizens in that surrounding area found themselves purchasing supplies from Josiah's agricultural supply store. Well, it was mainly due to this store's success, he became one of the leading businessmen around town. In addition to this, Josiah would also diversify his investments, purchasing a few more already fully functioning businesses as well. Now, as time went on, it just seemed like the sky was the limit for the Moore family. That is, until the night of June 9th, 1912. The entire family, along with two house guests, who were also children, had just got done attending an evening service at Villisca Presbyterian Church. It was at this time they made their way back home, where it is presumed the children indulged in a few cookies shortly before going to bed. Now, Sarah and Josiah would stay up just a little while longer before going to bed themselves. So at this point, you have six children, two adults, a total of eight individuals all sleeping inside that home. Or so they thought. It is said that while they were attending church, an individual had broken into their home and made their way up into the attic. It was there they would smoke a few cigarettes, waiting it out for the perfect opportunity to strike. And at some point between the hours of midnight and 5 a.m., the killer or killers exited the attic of that home and made their way to the master bedroom. It was at that time several blows were delivered to Mr. and Mrs. Moore, killing them in the process. The intruder then began making his way through the rest of the house, entering the boys' bedroom next and taking them all out one by one. And one thing that's a little odd is throughout this entire attack, Mr. and Mrs. Moore were the only ones who suffered the fate with the sharp end of that axe. For one reason or another, the killer had switched to the blunt end of it on all the children. At any rate, as this terrifying atrocity is taking place, it is said one of the two visiting children, Lena Stillinger, had woken up. Now, whether this was when her sister was being murdered right next to her in that guest bedroom or whether she woke up at some other point is unknown. But the reason this is believed to be true is because Lena was the only one in the house with any sort of defensive wounds. This, coupled with the fact she had been found sprawled out on top of the sheets of that bed, are quite synonymous with somebody being knocked out from a standing position onto the the bed itself. Well, after the killer or killers were absolutely sure everyone in the house had been killed, he, she, or they made their way back to the master bedroom to deliver a few more blows to Josiah and Sarah. And it is widely believed that whoever these killers were had a personal vendetta against the Moore parents. Not only because of the amount of wounds that were found on them, but whoever these killers were became so enraged during this attack, they had been lifting the axe so high on the upswings, they actually took out a couple of chunks from the ceiling as well. Now it's presumed that at this point, the killers made their way back into the kitchen of the home, pulling out a slab of bacon and leaving it next to the very murder weapon used inside that house. Well, roughly two hours later at around 7 a.m., the Moore's neighbor, Mary Peckham, began to notice there was absolutely no movement whatsoever in or around the Moore's house. Now, this was highly unusual, as every morning, for as long as she can remember, the Moore's had a very specific routine, and the kids all had chores. But nothing was being done. And so Mary goes and knocks on the door, but there's no response. She then places a call to Ross Moore, Josiah's brother, to inform him of this inactivity, and he too immediately became concerned. Upon arriving, he would try to knock several times, but to no avail, complete silence. Ross then takes out a spare key that had been given to him by Josiah, turns the lock, 
walks inside, but nothing, and I mean nothing, could have prepared him for the grisly scene that awaited him inside that domicile. Mary stays on the porch while Ross makes his way through the home, and the first victims to be discovered were the Stillinger sisters inside that guest bedroom. Ross then screams for Mary to call the Villisca primary peace officer, a man by the name of Henry Horton. It wasn't until this officer's walkthrough that the other victims would be discovered, all eight of whom had long since passed away due to their injuries. Well, news of this crime would spread like wildfire all across the region and eventually the rest of the United States, instilling a newfound fear in the hearts of many. As around this time period, there had been a rash of similar random acts of violence all over that region. And while there were strikingly similar cases from Iowa and the surrounding area, none of them were ever proven to be linked. Now, I also think it's worth pointing out, law enforcement practices back then were quite sloppy at best, and during the course of the investigation, several suspects were brought inside that home in order to attempt to recreate the crime if they were the ones to have done it, essentially handing them the murder weapon and telling them to describe them how they would have done it if they had. Thus, everything inside that house was absolutely contaminated. And it's also worth pointing out that at that time, there were in fact a few suspects, one of which being a previous employer of Josiah, Frank Jones. Now, the main reason he was considered to be a prime suspect in this case is that Josiah had quite literally taken business from Frank upon resigning his position at Frank's agricultural supply store. It is also said he took over the equipment rental market in the area by opening his own John Deere store, and many people assumed there had to have been some sort of grudge between the two. However, more than a fair share of individuals placed their bet on a traveling minister by the name of George Kelly. I mean, not only did this guy have a very peculiar background, but people in various towns had reported him for being a peeping Tom. In addition to this, on several of those occasions, it was also reported he had solicited underage girls to, let's just say, pose for him in provocative ways. Well, George had came into town on June 8th to give that very sermon the Moors had attended on that fateful night. And when everything was said and done, he ended up skipping town somewhere between 5.30 and 5.50 a.m. on the very morning the murders took place. Although he would be tried twice for this crime, the first of those two trials ended in a hung jury. Meaning, although some of the jury did in fact think he was guilty, the votes were not unanimous. As for the second trial, Mr. Kelly was acquitted on all charges. With that in mind, a few more suspects were investigated. However, all were completely exonerated from the particular crime, meaning the Villisca Axe murders still remain unsolved to this day. Now, the last thing I wanted to add in reference to this story is that there is a slight discrepancy with the fact cigarettes were found in the attic. While some sources state they in fact were found, others state that this simply wasn't true. In addition to this, some sources even go on to state that Mr. Moore himself used to go into the attic on certain occasions to smoke a cigarette. So whether or not the killer came in while they were at church or while they were asleep is still up for debate. Without further ado, let's hop into one of the strangest disappearances you will ever hear about. So this one takes us back to June of 2020, just a few months after those initial COVID lockdowns. There was a woman by the name of Sandra Hughes, and she had contacted a few of her family members to tell them she's going to be going on a rather lengthy camping trip to the Sierra National Forest, and it is stated her reason for doing so was to simply get away from the city. In essence, she figured this was one of the few ways she could remain healthy through all these lockdowns and the lingering threat of COVID. It. Little did anyone know, this will be the last time her family would ever hear her voice or physically see her ever again. Now, for those of you who don't know, the Sierra National Forest is roughly 2,000 square miles of rolling hills leading to lush forests, creeks, plenty of wildlife, and some of the most extreme elevation changes on the West Coast. Well, on June 26th of 2020, Sandra had made her way into a particular campsite within the Sierra National Forest known as Johnson Meadows. Now, what exactly happened over the next week and a half is a bit of a mystery, but what we do know is on July 5th, a couple of park rangers stumble upon the seemingly abandoned campsite. More so, the tent, as well as the surrounding area itself, was in complete and utter disarray. Several of Sandra's belongings will be found scattered all over the place, as well as her bags being completely emptied. Well, shortly thereafter, they find Sandra's car just a short distance away from the campsite in an area known as Chiquito Creek. And upon further inspection, it appears Sandra had driven off the road, hitting a tree in the process going well below 20 miles an hour. It is then theorized the car sort of bounced off said tree and began rolling down into a ravine. However, there was no substantial damage to the car itself. The airbags hadn't deployed, and yet again, Sandra is nowhere to be found. 
Now at this point, with reasonable concern for Sandra's well-being, investigators began calling her family to inform them of this news. And it was at this time a full-scale search was launched for Sandra, along with several volunteers, the Madera County Sheriff's Department, the California Highway Patrol, the government's Office of Emergency Services, and the California Air National Guard all came in to assist with said search. In the meantime, Sandra's family began posting missing persons posters at many of the different local businesses in the surrounding areas. Now, not too long after this, a couple of hikers come forward stating they had actually seen Sandra on July 4th, just one day prior to her campsite being discovered. And although Sandra did seem like she was in distress, with bruises all over her face walking around barefoot, Sandra actually repeatedly declined any assistance from the two hikers, and after a couple of minutes of going back and forth and realizing she just really didn't want their help, they left, and that was that. In addition to this, it wasn't until a few days later that they had seen the missing person's posters and realized just who it was they actually saw. Now, although this was rather disconcerting news for Sandra's family, they now at least had hope that she was still out there and alive. You see, when she was younger, Sandra had actually been through park ranger training and was considered to be an avid outdoor enthusiast, survivalist, etc., in other words, she had the skills necessary to take care of herself while out in the wild. In addition to this, she also would have known when to call it quits and get the hell out of there if she was in some sort of trouble. Well, fast forward all the way up to August 9th, just over a month since the last reported sighting of Sandra. A couple of hunters would spot her leaning up against a tree along a roadway fairly close to where she had crashed her car. And as they passed by her, not a single word was said. She didn't appear to be in distress and the bruises on her face had long since cleared up. By all accounts, she just seemed like a hiker taking a quick rest before moving on. And once again, it wasn't until they made their way back to town and saw one of those posters that they would call in that sighting. So at this point, no one really knows what to think. It's likely she would have known her vehicle had since been towed and that her campsite had been cleared out and taken in as evidence. Yet she still made no efforts to notify anyone as to what it is she was actually doing. Had she gotten into some sort of trouble? Did she have some sort of stalker that was preventing her from leaving the area? All these ideas were being tossed about, but not a single shred of physical evidence had ever been recovered since they had located her car. And although the search would continue on through the end of summer and a few more months, it would just keep winding down until eventually it was completely called off. But this isn't where the story ends. As a matter of fact, things are about to take a far more mysterious turn. Almost one year later, on the dot from the last sighting of Sandra, a family known as the Gorbas has taken a trip to the Sierra National Forest. And at some point, they decide to stop at a sort of picnic rest area in order to eat their lunch. Three-year-old Caden Gorber was seen talking to a completely non-existent person in the distance. Now, while his parents had initially just chalked this up to the young boy's imagination, as they go to leave and they are pulling out of that rest area, Caden was staring out the window so intently in distress, they finally stopped the car to ask him what's going on. To which he replied, There's a woman lying face down in that field and she needs our help. She's dead and she can't talk to us, but mom, dad, she really needs our help. So now, in order to put Caden's mind to rest, as well as their own, because let's face it, they are completely creeped out by what their kid is saying to them. They get out of the car and walk Caden over into this field, where they would spend the next half hour combing through it. But to no avail, nothing turned up. However, when they arrive home, his mother would post about this experience on Facebook. And within just a few days, the Madera County Sheriff's Office contacts her, stating, look, we would love to talk to your son about what exactly went down that day, as there is a strong correlation between the description your son gave and a missing persons case from last year. So Caden, along with his parents and the Madera County Sheriff's, head back up to that exact location and they spend the next few days completely combing through this field. But once again, not a single shred of evidence would be found. Well, Sandra Johnson Hughes remains a missing person to this very day. And while many people out there think, yes, it's quite possible she ran away to start a new life, others who have delved way deeper into this case than I have state this would have been completely out of character for her, and surely by now she has perished somewhere in those mountains. Number three. This last one takes us back to July of 1945, as World War II is in the process of winding down in the Western theater. The United States and Japan are still waging some extremely fierce battles over in the Eastern sector. Now, there was a specific ship in the United States Navy known as the USS Indianapolis. In short, the nearly 10,000 ton, 600 foot long heavy cruiser was not only one of the fastest in its class, it also had some of the most state of the art long range firepower available at the time. Well, coming into July, the ship had just been through a series of repairs, and immediately after,
afterwards, the crew receives orders for a top secret, now declassified mission, codenamed Little Boy. Essentially, they were to transport the components needed to produce an atomic bomb to an island known as Tinyan. And yes, this is the same bomb that would be dropped on Hiroshima just a few weeks later. Well, after successfully dropping off the cargo, the crew went on to receive a little bit of training prior to heading towards Okinawa. But unfortunately, they would never make it. Just two days later, at around 12.15 a.m., a loud explosion absolutely rocks the entirety of the ship. They'd just been hit by a torpedo fired by a Japanese submarine. It was at this point, they began taking on copious amounts of water. And here's the thing about the USS Indianapolis. The thing was extremely top-heavy, and it was mainly due to this. After about 12 minutes, the ship would completely flip over and dip below the surface of the sea. It was at this point, it begins careening into the dark abyss, taking roughly 300 of the 1,195 sailors with it, leaving about 800 people just bobbing along on the surface of the ocean, waiting to be rescued. Little did they know their ordeal was just getting started. Before too long, the sounds of scream and panic begin to ring out. Tiger sharks and oceanic white tips begin swarming the waters around them. And here's the thing, both of these are extremely aggressive species. Before too long, this all-out feeding frenzy just begins erupting. And due to the fact there was so much blood in the water, not to mention all the commotion and chaos going on on the surface, this just began attracting more and more predators. What's worse is, not a single soul even knew this attack had taken place. And over the course of the next four days, they would just sit there bobbing along in these groups, taking turns at who was going to be on the outer perimeter. It is presumed that although hundreds of men were almost certainly eaten by sharks, many would succumb to things like hypothermia, dehydration, drowning, and starvation. In addition to this, those remaining were actually discovered by mistake, as a plane flew over them during yet another training exercise. By the end of the ordeal, only 316 out of the original 1195 would actually be rescued. So that's it, y'all. That is going to do it for this episode of Three Creepy Things. If you think of anything I missed, feel free to leave it in the comments section below. And as always, I am completely open to any one of your personal requests. I will gladly take them into consideration, as this channel is still kind of small in size. I can get to them quite easily. With that in mind, I just want you to know, we are far from done with the TikTokers who did terrible things playlist, but I personally feel like after doing 11 of them in a row, we could all use a change of pace, and I hope this was something new that you enjoyed. In the meantime, I sincerely hope you have an amazing whatever it is, wherever you may be. Peace out.